say thing, are you ready for the word of the Lord? Yes. Others will read a passage that frightens me to no end. In fact, it's a passage that I look at and I say, Lord, if I shouldn't be a pastor. <laughs> so this evening, let's look with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34. Let's read the word of the Lord together. Here it says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the stray you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouth that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep, and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when he is among his sheep that has been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples, and gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. Then they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. And the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed, I will feed them in justice. Lord, so this evening as we come before your word, we ask you for wisdom and for understanding. We ask you for a spirit of revelation, Lord, we ask for a spirit of the fear of the Almighty God. Open our eyes, the eyes of our heart, to behold your truth, so that, Lord, our, our lives will be changed and transformed into your likeness. We thank you, we bless you, we pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. But this evening, we continue our story through the our journey through the Bible story, and we come to a subject which is sadly quite prominent and a subject that can be quite painful. I'm sure over the years, many of us would have been aware of the growing number of cases involving well-known Christian leaders who have sinned against the Lord, who have sinned against the church, and who have fallen. So the issue of leaders, the issue of leaders who have been entrusted by God to a sacred position with great responsibility, when the issue of leaders have abused this position of responsibilities 
is also a position of privilege. What has been on the mind and on the hearts of many people today, believers or non-believers alike. Why? Very simply, the experience of any institution, whether it be it a family, be it be a school, be it be a business, may it be a church or a nation, largely depends on the kind of leaders that you have. Whether your leaders are of integrity or of high responsibility is of great importance. And here Ezekiel 34 describes how God's people have suffered, how God's people have languished, how they have deteriorated under leaders, under leadership that has been irresponsible, leadership that has been abusive, and how God at the end had to intervene all by himself. So if we have suffered under poor leadership, if we have suffered under abusive leadership in any area of our life, well, this message is for all of us. But yet, if we have been entrusted with leadership of any kind, maybe leadership in our home, in the school, in a company, in business, or in the nation, or in the church, well, this chapter will also show us what God really requires of us and how in our chosen position of leadership we can be found faithful to the calling that God has given to us. But in some of the messages before this, I have shared with you that there are three different, three distinct kinds of leaderships, different roles given to us in the Old Testament. And what are they? They are the role of the prophet, the role of the priest, and the role of the king, isn't it? So here we have one time look at this, that the prophets really have a ministry of revelation. Their calling really was to stand in the presence of God. And as they come into the presence of God, they are to hear what God speaks to them. And whatever God speaks to them, they will then speak God's word to God's people. So here, the role of the prophet has a role of that, the ministry of revelation. How about the priest? Well, the priests have a ministry of what I would term reconciliation. Their, their calling was to be the one that offered prayers to the Lord, and they are also asked to offer sacrifices in the temple of God. So when they offer sacrifices, when they offer prayers, then they will bring God's people into the presence of God. In today's term, we can say that perhaps they, they will have this ministry of what we call pastoral care, and also they are given the ministry of intercession as well. Then what do we have next? We have, first of all, the prophets have the work of revelation, then the priests have the work of reconciliation, then the third distinct group, what do you have? The kings. Well, the calling of the kings is really in the area of ruling. Their calling was to lead God's people into path of righteousness, to walk rightly before God. Their role as king is to protect the people of God from enemies, from the enemies in a sense. So all these three, all these three leaders, these three ministries, they were very, very important. The priests, the prophet and the king, taken together, shows to us what is God's plan for leadership. So if you want to have a biblical understanding of what godly biblical leadership entails, it is this, right? It's all right there. It's to lead people into God's truth. It's to bring people before the Lord. Then it's to lead them, right, in protection and on path of Righteousness. That is so important. Now when we come to Ezekiel 34, what is happening? We have an image of a shepherd. I'd like to submit to you that this image of the shepherd used here simply brings all the three, all these three roles together. The roles of the priest, the prophet, and the king into one beautiful picture that encompasses all the dimensions, all the aspects of what God is looking for in strong, godly leadership. 
Think about it with me. Right? Now the shepherd feeds the sheep. He's the one that nourishes the flock with a healthy diet of God's word. So there is that prophetic element to the work of the shepherd. Well, look at it again. The shepherd also seeks out the sheep. He must care for the flock, watching especially for those who have strayed away, those who are injured or have become weak. So there is this priestly role that is part of the work of the shepherd as well. And of course, very obviously, the shepherd leads the sheep. The shepherd leads the sheep. Right? So he gives direction. The next one. He gives direction. He must give protection to the flock of God. So there is that kingly role, which is its very nature. It's wrapped out. Right? All the three roles are all wrapped out into this image of what we call a shepherd. So when God speaks about shepherd, he's describing everything that is involved in leading, in feeding, in guarding, in protecting, in seeking, nurturing the people of God. And it's a whole of Christian leadership that is summed up, that is summed up in this very beautiful picture of a shepherd. Those of us who are working in, out there in the business world, every year, right? Every year, those of you who are supervisors or managers, you actually have an instrument that you review and evaluate your employees under you for the work that was given to them for the past year, isn't it? You call that an appraisal, you call that an interview, you call that an, in, uh, an, an assessment or whatever. Well, when it comes to Ezekiel 34, well, God is doing an appraisal. This one is done by the Almighty God, that God did it Himself, and we did it on the spiritual leadership of Israel. The result wasn't a good one. The appraisal was poor. Here, God had entrusted the shepherds of Israel with great responsibility. At the end of it, at the appraisal, this is what God said to them. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds be feeding the sheep? That's what God is asking. At the end of the appraisal, it was not a nice appraisal. So there are four things as we look at this passage in Ezekiel 34 this evening that I'd like to surface for our consideration. The first thing for us to consider is this, that God would indict, God would indict abusive shepherds. That is a given. And here in these indictments, there are three charges, there are three indictments that God brings against the leaders of His own people. So what are they? The first one, is that he, he, he indicts leaders who abuse their power. Leaders are given position. Leaders are given power. But when you abuse that power, God brings a charge against us. In Ezekiel 34, verse 4, it says, The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the stray, the straight you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have rule them. Look back into the history of Israel. Over the many years, right, as we have seen, God's people came under or they suffered under kings that the Lord has put over them. And so many of these kings has placed heavy burdens on the people of God. In fact, some of the kings that were in place, some of them were wicked. And even the best kings Many of them place upon the, upon the people of God all kinds of burden that were just too hard to bear. Do this, do this, it's required of you. Get this, get that, and all that. So God indicted these kings for their failure to really care for the flock. What is God saying? What is saying? As his shepherds, you have a calling and a responsibility to the people that have been entrusted to you. Instead of using a position to strengthen the people, you have instead used the people 
to strengthen your position. And that's what God is saying here. So God will bring an indictment against leaders who abuse their power. Just because we have a title, it can be abused. Secondly, the second charge that God has against them, uh, against God will indict leaders who subvert the truth. Turn with me to Ezekiel 13 and you will see this clearly. God specifically spoke to those who claim to be prophets but who have replaced the word of God with their own words or their own opinion. Look at what is being said in Ezekiel 32, uh, 13, verse 2 and 3. It says, The Son of Man prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are prophesying and say, and say to those who prophesy from their own hearts, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Case and I were in UK, 20, end of 2013, beginning of 2014. There was one of a church that we went to one Sunday for, for worship. And the speaker, the leader, the pastor, that, in that morning spoke the word of the Lord. And for the 20 odd minutes, there was no scripture that was read. He simply read from an article that he had in front of him and he was sharing his opinion of what he think the author of the article was talking about. I couldn't, we couldn't believe that that is a worship service. But it was a full-blown worship service. So here, there may be leaders whose ministry is not, you are not driven by truth. More, you could be driven by demand. You may, be, you may not be speaking or teaching the whole counsel of God. You may be just teaching and speaking what is what you think should be done or what you think the people want to hear. So they do not speak the word of God, but notice what they do speak. They prophesy from their own hearts. They follow their own spirit. In other words, the source of truth for them it's an inclination that they find within themselves, what they feel like teaching, what they feel like preaching. And they share their opinion of, instead of going into the Word of God to tell them what does God say about a certain thing. So it can happen, God indicts leaders who first abuse their power. Secondly, He indicts leaders who subvert the truth. Thirdly, God brings indictments against leaders to profane the Lord Himself. And the word profane simply means to treat God with contempt. In other words, to profane the Lord means we treat God Himself with contempt. We see that in Ezekiel 22, verse 26, it says here, Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. So I am profane among them. So these priests are people who are called into a vocational role, in a sense. Priests in the temple of God. And God says, they treat me with contempt. In other words, God is saying, I carry no weight in their lives. In our contemporary terms, God is saying, you see me no up. They can't make a difference between the holy and the unclean, in a sense. So here are people of leadership and influence among God's people, and they do not know the fear of God. They begin to lead the church, lead the organization, lead, lead the ministry in the temple from a secular position. So what they are doing, they are not exercising a God work ministry that's supposed to bring people towards God, what is on the heart of God. But they were simply just helping people feel good about themselves. So their whole ministry would be more of a human horizontal level, a ministry that has lost touch about really who God really is. Last week we just saw that in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 12, isn't it? It's what they say, Son of man, 
Have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark? Each in his own room of pictures, for they say, the Lord does not see us. They have got leaders who live their life without the fear of the Lord, who live by the body to their own passions, own desires. This is what happened. Here the priests were actually scrolling. Historians tell us they were actually scrolling pornographic images in the temple of God, and they think that it is okay. They cast off all restraint. In the temple of God, you can do such thing. Why? They simply think it's all right. God does not see us. They think they can get away. So they have no sense that one day, everyone has to come into the presence of God to give an account. So here was really God's indictment in Ezekiel 34. God looked at the shepherds of Israel, those who have been entrusted with the proclamation of truth, the pastoral care and the intercession for the people and the protection and the defending of the people of God. And what God saw was that power was abused, truth was subverted, God himself was profane and treated with contempt, and the effect of all this was that God's sheep language. They were not nourished. They were not cared for. They were open to the wolves because why? They were not protected by the leaders who are supposed to be doing this job. So great damage, great damage was really done to the sheep as a result. Verse 5 and 6 of chapter 34, Ezekiel tells us, they were scattered because there was no shepherd. They became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. And God will not let this stand. That's the whole point of Ezekiel 34. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherd. It is so, so important for shepherds to be teaching well from the Word of God and not teaching what they feel like they want to teach. And in these last days, the Bible tells us the ears of believers will be itching. And we will itch to hear what, what is good. Right? And we will rather hear comfort. God does not want us to be comfortable. God wants to mold us into the image of God. God will challenge us about the way we live our life. So, listen, it's so important. So, dear friends, let's take this into our hearts today. One day, every king, every president, Every CEO, every pastor, including me, every connect group leaders, and you think that you are you can escape if you are not. Every parent, every person will stand before the judgment seat of God. You will be there. I can promise you. Of course, I will be there too. All of us like to hear. We think that all of us will hear a good and faithful servant. We wish, let's pray we will be hearing that. But these verses made it clear that those who abuse the power, those that subvert the truth of God, those that profane God's name, what does God say? I am against you. Let's take that with a sense of propriety. Proverbs 9.10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is a beginning of wisdom. We must learn to live our life. We must learn to, to handle the responsibility God has given to us with an eye on the judgment seat of God. That God is not just our good saviour. He is our good judge as well. Hebrews 4.13 says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That is what the word of the Lord is to the shepherds of Israel and to all of us today. So first thing, God indicts the leaders, the shepherds. The second thing, what we we'll consider this evening, is that Christ is the true shepherd. What does God do in response to all that he's observing? He says in verse 15, Ezekiel chapter 34, I myself 
will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. So now for any one of us, for any one of us who have suffered under leaders who have abused their powers, leaders who have subverted the truth or have profaned the Lord, this is the word, this is the word that we most need to hear. God says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. God is the one who says, I will feed you. I'll bring you back to myself. I'll protect and I'll defend you. I'll lead you into the right path. Notice, if you look at this whole chapter, in chapter 34, how many times God refers to the flock as his sheep or my sheep. Look at what he says. Verse 5 tells us, My sheep were scattered. My sheep were scattered with none to search or to seek for them. My sheep had become a prey. My sheep had become food for all the wild beasts. My shepherd had not searched for my sheep. They have not fed my sheep. Thus I am against the shepherd, and I will require my sheep at their hands, as in verse 10. It goes on. I will rescue my sheep from their mouth. I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them. God says, the flock is mine. Thus, I will rescue them. I will gather them. I will feed them. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. What God is saying is that He Himself, He says, God says, I will be the prophet. I will be the priest. And I will be the king to my people. I will personally bring the truth to them. I will personally care for them, for my people, and bring my people to myself. God is saying, I will personally protect them and lead them in the right path. So how is God going to accomplish that? We need to roll the story 600 years forward. In John chapter 10, verse 11, right? Jesus is born into this world, and then what did he say? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. So by saying this phrase, I am the good shepherd, Jesus was directly identifying himself as God himself. Which is why when he said that, the people were upset. And they picked up stones at the end of John chapter 10. They were throwing stones at him. Why? In those days we say, I am the good shepherd. When Jesus said that, there was for him to identify himself as the almighty God who is the shepherd of Israel and who proclaims himself to be such a shepherd in Ezekiel 34, right? In Ezekiel 34, God says, I will be the shepherd. And Jesus says, I am he. In John chapter 10, verse 36, this was God coming to reveal the truth, and he's saying, I am the truth. I've come to bring you back to God. I've come to protect and to defend you. I've come to lead you onto the right path, the path of righteousness. So here, Jesus is really the good shepherd. Jesus is really the good shepherd. He is God with us. God came among us to feed the sheep, to seek his sheep, to lead his sheep. He's the one who will nourish us in the truth. Which is why he says, I am the bread of life. He will nourish us. He's the one who will bring us back to God. He's the one who will reconcile us back to God. And, he, and it's why he went to the cross. He's the one who will protect us from our enemies so that when our last enemy itself, which is death itself, when death, when death comes at us, he's the one that will bring us from death to life. He's the one that will grant unto us everlasting life. So speaking straight out of Ezekiel 34, right? he says, My sheep will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus himself said that. In John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28, that's right out from Ezekiel 34. The father was the one that gave the sheep to the son. The son was the one who redeemed them at a very inexpressible cost. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws and brings the sheep to Christ. Right? And because they are so precious, but no one, no one, not an abusive shepherd, 
who subverts the truth, who profanes God's name, no one will ever snatch them out from my hand. That's what Jesus is saying to all of us, for you are my sheep. Now let us, there's something I want us to take in and to ponder all right, for this evening. I want us to know that Jesus Christ himself has a very tender, a special tenderness towards people who have suffered under abusive shepherds. Because why? He himself know what it is to suffer under abusive leadership himself. So when God fulfilled, when God fulfilled His promise that was given in Ezekiel 34 that He will be our shepherd, is when Jesus came into this world. Notice, when Jesus Christ came into the world, large crowds were drawn to Him. Other shepherds who saw the danger of losing their flock to Jesus, right? They end up coming up against Him. That's why in the end, the leaders were the ones the, the other shepherds were the one who got Jesus arrested and the good shepherd was brought before trial, before those failing shepherds of Jesus' day. So you look at the story of Jesus very significantly. The role of the priest, the king and the prophet all played a part. All figured in the story of the trial of Jesus. If you remember the story, it started with what? It started with Caiaphas, the high priest, and the priest who profaned the Lord. They treated Jesus with contempt. When Jesus was arrested, he was first tried in the house of Caiaphas. And Matthew records for us that the priest spat at his face. That the priest was the one that struck him, and all that, in Matthew 26. So here, Jesus suffered physical abuse in the house of the priest. Then there was King Herod, a king who was notorious for abusing his power. He was the one who ordered the execution of John the Baptist. Because why? He didn't like what John the Baptist said. So Herod wasn't a shepherd. Herod was not like a butcher, so to speak, in a sense. So here the king was responsible for protecting the sheep. Well, he did nothing to protect Jesus at all. So if any one of us has been in a place where we realize that there's no hope of justice or whatsoever, well, understand that the Lord Jesus Christ himself had been there too. And that was where he found himself, in the house of Aaron. Then there was the other third figure, Pilate, the governor, who subverted the truth. Pilate, of course, was not a prophet, not at all. But here is something very interesting that we are told about Pilate. It appears that his wife received some kind of revelation right, during the trial of Jesus. So here we read in Matthew 27, verse 19, While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in the dream. So it was Pilate's duty in the trial to establish the truth. And Jesus spoke to him about truth. In John chapter 18, verse 37, Jesus said, Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. But Pilate was totally not interested in anything that Jesus said. Then that's why he washed his hands. And what did this man do, right? And what did this man who was responsible for establishing do? Well, he goes to the popular vote. He gave in to the popular, popular vote of the people when they were asking for him to be crucified. He gave in to them without establishing the truth. So here, Jesus was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He became the sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world. But here's the point I'm making today. Because of what Jesus himself had gone through, I want us to know that He as our Lord, He as our Shepherd, He has a very special tenderness towards those who have suffered under abusive leaders because He Himself suffered under abusive shepherds, even as He Himself was the priest 
the prophet became himself. That's why if we have suffered under such leaders, we can come to him. Our Savior knows what is it like to suffer under those who abuse power, subvert truth and care more for themselves than for us or for God. That means if we have suffered under abusive leadership, we have a leader to whom, we have a Savior to whom we can come. That, to me, seems to be the most important thing to the comfort of the people of God in Ezekiel 34. So first of all, God will indict abusive shepherds. Secondly, Christ is the truth, the true shepherd. The third thing for us to consider is of course Jesus offers himself as our shepherd. Listen to these words that are prophetic clearly about Jesus himself in verse in verse 16, chapter 34, Ezekiel says, I will seek the laws, I will bring back the stray, I will bind up the injured, I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy, I will feed them in justice. Hear what did, hear what did the word say? It talks about Jesus. I will seek the laws. What does it mean to be lost? The word lost means we don't know where we are, right? And, where, and we can't find our way back to where we need to be. So here I'm saying, for any of us who says that we are lost, who feels utterly lost today, well, Jesus came to seek us out, and He is coming to save us. If you don't know who you are, where you are, where you should be going, come to Jesus, because He came to seek the lost, and He is the one who will bring us home. Secondly, what did He say? First he says, I'll seek the lost. Then secondly, he says, I will bring back the stray. Stray means that we have drifted away from the other sheep. Sometimes we backslide. Sometimes we end up missing in action. Whatever, something happened, we got ourselves, we found ourselves out all alone. It's our being in the community of God. You are right now on the fringe of God's people. Well, you, you feel that you are distant away, you are isolated on your own, and because you are alone, we, when we are alone, you'll find that we are most vulnerable. So I'm saying to those of us here who has drifted today, to the one who has lost, some of us may have lost our first love we once had for Christ, well, I'm saying Jesus himself, as our true shepherd, he can bring us back. You may be saying, I don't know how to get back. Well, I'm saying, Christ will bring us back. All we need to do is to turn to Him and say, Lord Jesus, I am a straight sheep. You are my shepherd. And today, I return to You. And allow Him to bring you back. Because His word to us, right? And that's why He came. He came to bring us back. The third thing, He says, I will bind up the injured. To be injured means that something happened in our life. Something that has crushed us. Something that has hurt us. Something has happened that has really hurt us and left us unable to do what we were able to do before. Perhaps we have been injured by someone who is an abusive leader. But well, Christ said to us, He's the one who will bind up our wounds. He's the one that will heal us of our pain. So Jesus says, I will bind up your wounds. Then some verse may say, well, my wounds are really deep. Well, Jesus said to us, there is no wound that he cannot heal. Some of us have got bad experiences in the past under such leaders. And because of the hurt we have sustained, well, we are kind of out of the picture. Because of the fear of being injured again and all that, that's not the position that Jesus wants us to be. He wants to come to Him, allow Him to heal us, restore us, and then we are made whole again. What else did He say? He says, I will strengthen the weak. To be, to be weak means we do not have the strength to do what we need to do. And to those who say, I don't know how I'm going to face this week, Jesus says to us, He will be the one that will strengthen us. Some of us are walking through big challenges. 
and often times to wonder, can I ever get through this week? Can I ever get through this month? Again, do we handle all the things in our own strength? Or do we come to the Lord to say, Lord, when I am weak, then I can experience your strength. When I am weak, then I experience that your grace is sufficient. Who do we turn to when we are weak? When we are being stripped bare, what is left? It's about learning to come to the shepherd of our soul. Because he said, we will strengthen the weak. But notice what is the last phrase that's being said, the fat and the strong, I will destroy. What does that mean? The fat and the strong are those who feel that they don't have a need of the shepherd. The fat and the strong are those who will resist his rule. This is the only position in which there is no hope. The position that pushes Jesus away and that says, I've got no need for the shepherd. I myself, I can run my house. I myself, I can manage the situation. Leave me alone. I will shepherd myself. If you think that we are the fat and the strong, Jesus says, I will destroy. You see, as soon as we say that, we are putting ourselves into God's place. God says, I'm the shepherd, you are my sheep. But if you say you are strong, you are on your own, Jesus will leave us on our own. If we think we have got no need for the shepherd. So what a marvelous, what a marvelous thing. Right? What a marvelous thing to be totally owned and managed by the Son of God. When we can say, the Lord is my shepherd. Then we can say what follows, I shall not want. So the three things first to consider so far, the Lord indicts abusive shepherds. Secondly, Jesus is the true shepherd. The third thing, Jesus offered himself as our shepherd. The last thing was to consider this evening, Jesus calls us to shepherd others. What does it mean to be a shepherd? Well, it simply means that we are to be a prophet, a priest, and a king. For that is what the biblical model of leadership is given to us. As we think about applying this, all right? Well, as parents, as parents we can apply this. So here God calls parents. Here God calls parents to be the shepherd of the children that he has entrusted to us. This means that it is God's plan that in every home there should be a prophetic ministry of teaching our children through the word and by example. I shared you before, I'm very impressed by my son-in-law and my daughter, that my five plus year old grandson Quite every morning, he will get to read a scripture, and then he will write out. He will write out the scripture. He will write out the scripture. I overheard him asking his father. He says, "Dad, how many wives does Solomon have?" <laughs> Bitterly asked, "How come so many wives?" <laughs> See, when there is the parental role of really teaching the truth of God's word. The children are on the right path. So here there is that that is God plan in every home that there's a teaching of the word of God and then we live by example before them. In every home there should be a priestly ministry of praying for our children and building them up. In each home there, there should be a kingly ministry of protecting our children, guiding them in right path. This is a responsibility that God gives to parents. So here, as a practical thing, we are to be shepherds of our children. Of course, this same thing applies to leadership roles of every kind. It's essential to the health of any organization. It's the same role that God has given to the leaders of any church, in a sense. What does the church need for its life and its health? Under the guidance of the chief shepherd, the church needs a prophetic ministry of the word of God. And, and it's you need to, we, need to, we need to be in a church that really proclaims unashamedly the whole counsel of God. We need to be in such a church where we have a priestly ministry of prayer. Leaders pray for the members as well as providing pastoral care and there should be a kingly function of 
protecting, defending, and of leading the members into the right path. The day you discover that the Vine Church does not do all these three, I give you permission to walk out. Because that is not the church that we must be. Yet at the same time, I humbly submit to you that as leaders of this church, by the grace of God, this is what we want to learn to commit ourselves to be leading the church with such godly leadership. We are not perfect. We fail many a times. We do neglect situations. Which is why I humbly ask of you, on one hand, right, honor the leaders in our midst. Yet on the other hand, pray to the Lord. Pray to the Lord that these leaders that He has placed in our church will be godly leaders who practices these principles of godly leadership. Then I want us to remember this, the ministry of the prophet, the priest, and the king. In the Old Testament, they were limited to only a few selected people. So lest you think that that role is given just to a few leaders, you are wrong. Why? In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, we are told, I will pour out my spirit on what? All flesh, and on and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Here in the New Testament, all of God's people are called to this ministry of being shepherds of people. Notice, not just a few. The Spirit of the Lord has been poured out on all flesh. So when He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, it means that God can use any one of us. God can use any one of us to speak His truth at any one time. Which is why I'm asking each of us, we need to be men and women of God's Word. If we do not know the Bible, how can you be speaking the truth? When you come before the Lord, you have no excuse. No excuse. I didn't read. You got no excuse. Because why you've been here for so long? How many times have you been telling about reading God's Word? You can't count them. So you have got no excuse. But that's not my point. My point here is when we grow in the, in the knowledge of God's Word, God can use us to speak the truth to another person who needs to hear it. We don't need to be a gifted speaker. Right? I'm not a very charismatic speaker in a sense, but I want to be committed as a good teacher. So we don't need to be a gifted speaker, but we need to be great learners of God's truth. And God will use us to speak His truth to someone. When the need is there, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 2 9, he says, We are a royal priesthood. In other words, every believer has the freedom, every believer has the ability to pray for any other person at any one time. Don't have to tell somebody, Wait now, wait now, let me get my connect leader to come and pray for you. Don't have to do that. God has given us the calling, God has given us the capacity that when we pray, He will hear us. When someone is sick, let me pray for you. Don't have to say, let me wait, let me get my pastor to pray for you. No need, the pastor's prayer is not any more powerful than your own prayer. If your faith is strong, your prayer may be more powerful than you can ever imagine. So here, not only are we a prophet and a priest, but in Christ, we are also a king in some sense. Because God has raised us up with Christ, He has seated us in the heavenly places with Him. So we are in a new position. And the evidence of this is that right now, the Holy Spirit is in each of us. Learn to walk with the Holy Spirit. Learn to, learn to, to sense the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Allow the Spirit to lead you and to guide you. Let me tell you, when you try to sin, if you are, if you are, if you are yielding the temptation, the Holy Spirit will remind you, you are sinning. It's whether you want to obey or not. So if you learn to listen to the Spirit, He will be the one that leads us, go to this person, go to that person. Do this, do that. Walk in this way, walk in that way. And when we, when we learn to be so familiar, with the leading of the Holy Spirit. He Himself will guide us and lead us 
to where we should go, who we should be ministering to, what we should be doing. Cultivate, cultivate the familiarity of knowing how the Holy Spirit speaks to each of us. He will prompt us, give someone a call. He will prompt us, send a text, send an encouragement to someone. Right? He will say, okay, you should help this person, you should help that person. So when we do that, when we do that, then we are being led and we can lead others. So here we are, if we are to shepherd others, we need to first of all learn to walk with the shepherd of our soul. We've got to learn to spend time with the Lord to know Him. And when we are walking with the good shepherd of our soul, right, then we can actually be able to see, learn from David. David is a person who knows his shepherd. So that's why he could end it down for us. The Lord is my shepherd. Are we led by the Lord? Are we taught by the Lord? We watch over the Lord when we experience the Lord Himself as our shepherd. Only then can we shepherd others. Then we are given responsibility for others. Sometimes we will we will kind of respond with fear and with trembling in a sense. You ask who can do this, who can do that? But when we are learning to walk with our shepherd, He is the one who empowers us. Because He is sufficient for all of our needs. So when the Lord is truly our shepherd, then we have all that we need. And we can rise up into whatever role of leadership, of care over people that you entrust to us. So let's learn to do that. Let's learn to really, really know the shepherd of our soul. And when we experience him as our shepherd, then can we Learn to shepherd others. Let's close in prayer together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the richness of your word. The Lord, your word reveals truth about so many, many things in our life. Lord, the Word does not shy away from addressing issues. And yet, when you address issues, Lord, well, we thank you that you are a God who address issues because you are a God of love. Your desire is to bring people back to you. Even when you discipline, even when you rebuke, Lord, your desire is to restore. Your desire is for your people to understand what is really your heart as Abba Father. So Father, we thank you for these words. Thank you that you have placed such requirements on leadership, on leaders that you that you have entrusted with this position and responsibility. And Lord, we pray that for us as a mind church, Lord, we will always have leaders who walk in the fear of the Lord. We we'll have leaders who love you with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. We have leaders who will rise up, not dependent on their own, but totally, fully dependent upon you. So Lord, as you empower and anoint these leaders, Lord, they will be leaders who will be used by you. Lord, that this whole church as a family will be blessed. I pray for each of us, Lord, that even in the weeks to come, in the days to come, Continue to draw us into your presence. Give us continually a new desire to know you more. Give us a desire to, to walk with you. Give us a fresh love for your word on a daily basis. So that, Father, we can, Lord, at your own time, your own calling, be, be, be called by you, Lord, to shepherd others as well. So, for Lord, may we, each of us, be able, out of our own walk with you, be able to say, Lord, you are our shepherd. And because you are our shepherd, we will have no want. We thank you, we bless you, we pray and ask all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.